Uh, Vinay is um, the Director of Financial Services for the Economic Development Board of Mauritius. Um, he started his career um, in design engineering before moving into supply and chain management. He's worked at, at the, with flagship organizations such as Unilever, Coca-Cola, and Maersk, um, working in various roles. He's currently uh, the Director of the Economic Development Board um, of Mauritius. Um, he's participated in a number of projects um, across the continent, and his main ambition being that to promote economic diversification to, of Africa and to support its um, continued growth um, and transition those African countries um, into the global supply chain. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Vinay onto the stage. Vinay. Thank you, Richard. Good morning to all of you. Welcome to this after tea session. Usually it's quite a uh, uh, you know, slow start back after tea, but uh, hopefully we'll bring the crowd back in. So <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, just uh, uh, thank you for that introduction because that's exactly what we'll be building on. Uh, we all know the continent, uh, Africa, has a lot of potential. 30% of the world minerals reserves, the fastest growing demography in the world that is expected to reach 2.5 billion by 2050, and also 60% of the untapped arable land of the world. I mean, if you go in, uh, I don't know if you've visited any country in Africa, wherever you go, you see a lot of trees and, and, and land that is not put at use to create real revenue. I mean, you don't see that in a country like Holland. If you go every square inch in Holland is used to create revenue, right? And we don't see that in Africa. Imagine if we can do that, what the continent could create. We heard earlier, I don't know if you were in the room, we heard a guy called Charlie Robertson talking about the cost of finance and the expectation in the next five to 10 years, uh, the fastest growing economies and the world GDP growth is going to be driven by African economies. We can already see that pre-COVID, Seven out of the ten fastest, fastest growing economies were on the continent, and post-COVID, six out of the fastest growing GDPs are back on the continent. So we can see Africa's building resilience. We can see there is uh, this ability for Africa to really drive uh, future economic growth of the globe. But how do we do that? How do we manage that negative perception that the continent have to global investors? How do we reduce the cost of finance? These are questions that we need to answer. And hopefully the Mauritius IFC, which I will talk a little bit of, could be a, a part of that solution going forward. Just to introduce Mauritius briefly to you, uh, so this, this is just a uh, macroeconomy of Mauritius uh, in terms of figures. Uh, we have a GDP per capita which is closing on $10,000. Uh, 92% of the population is literate. So these, these are just macroeconomic commercials, but I think this slide is, is the most important one. What we can see here is that over, since our independence 55 years ago, uh, Mauritius moved from a monocrop economy back at independence, which was 80% of the GDP was on agriculture, and 80% of that was sugarcane. And in the 70s, it was the diversification into industrialization. Then it came uh, into uh, hospitality, the textile industry. Then again, diversified in the 1990s with the financial services sector. And then in the early 2000s, it was the ICT BPO sector. And now it's more about modern manufacturing, biotech, uh, technology, edutech. And uh, we even like, uh, if you look at the 80s and 90s, the biggest export from Mauritius was textile and apparel. Now the biggest export from Mauritius to France and India are medical devices, catheters that is used for people with high blood pressure and so on, block arteries. So that... Uh, continuous diversification of the economy, that co continuous re-engineering of the economy of Mauritius, this is something that we would like to share with our, our uh, other African countries to be able to diversify Africa. And as you've seen earlier when Richard introduced me, that's part of my life uh, uh, mandate, uh, trying to really take Africa up the value chain and get that diversification uh, for the continent. Another reason why uh, Mauritius, because if you look at uh, the global uh, accolades that Mauritius have, 
we are trying to create a jurisdiction that will drive a confidence to investors. When investors uh, are looking at the continent right now and they see the risk and they need a jurisdiction to mitigate that risk. And that's what we want to create. And that's why, whether it's about ease of doing business, whether it's about uh, um, democracy, whether it's about governance, you will find that Mauritius uh, does very well. They, they, not just in Africa, where the number one or number two in most of these indices, but you'll find globally when top 20 in a lot of them as well, that gives that credibility and the stability that the global investors are looking for. Right. Another, another uh, aspect of the stability is your legal system, because people, uh, companies need to know uh, how the courts act. You know, can you go to court? Can you uh, get uh, the right judgment for your litigation? Can you always go and ha have the right appeal. And the good thing on Mauritius is that the highest court of appeal is actually the Privy Council of the King here in, in, in the UK. So if you're not happy with the Supreme Court of Mauritius, which is the highest court of appeal in Mauritius, you can always uh, come to, to, to the King's uh, uh, Privy Council uh, for, for, for your concerns. But also we have the permanent arbitration, court of arbitration in Mauritius, uh, which is we have two of them, uh, that is uh, cost effective and, and, and the judgment are very worries. Uh, implemented. If you look at uh, recognition as well, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, when COVID strike, uh, usually, you know, uh, bad things don't come alone, they come together. So we had COVID, we had to close down our borders for one and a half year, you can imagine. We uh, The tourism sector is one of the major pillar, pillars of the Mauritian economy, and we didn't receive any income for tourism for 18 months, and we got gray listed by the Financial Action Task Force at the same time. But the wonderful thing is that within 14 months, we got out of the Financial Action Task Force uh, of the gray list. Uh, and that was because of everybody got together. And I think in a way COVID helped us because we had no other thing to do, but we all sat together and we said, how do we fix this? And we fixed it. And 14 months later, we got out of that gray listing. And we went even one step further after getting out of the gray listing. Today, Mauritius meets all, is compliant to all 40 requirements of the Financial Action Task Force. And there are only six jurisdictions in the world that has achieved such a feat. So from being gray listed in 2020 to today being the best when it comes uh, in, in terms of, of meeting the requirements for the national uh, task force, that's what Mauritius is. And other countries are coming to Mauritius now to seek our guidance to get out of their own gray listing uh, concerns, such as South Africa, which we're helping uh, in terms of uh, information sharing, training, and development where we're collaborating. And of course, I think one thing which is very interesting, I think it's one of the unique jurisdictions in the world that has, that has a hybrid legal system. That is based both on the French uh, Code Civil, uh, Code Napoleon, and the British Common Law as well. So whenever you, you need to go to court uh, to, to, you know, like if, if you're getting married, that's like the British Common Law, but if you're buying a house, then we go according to the uh, Code Civil. And which is very good for Africa because 95% uh, of the countries on the continent are either francophone or anglophone countries. So if you want uh, to structure anything into the continent, it's always good to go to, into a country that will give you the good legal understanding on how the corporate law or the competition law works in each of these countries uh, to, to do that as well. Right. So I won't uh, go too much on this because tomorrow uh, there is a segment on Mauritius Investment Summit as well. Um, what it says in summary, I'll just take a minute to say that. Uh, it shows here, this is potentially a very good slide to sum it up. The good thing about Mauritius is that, you know, we are very welcoming, we're very charming, we've become friends with everybody, and our trading map shows that. We are one of the few countries in the world that has a free trade agreement with China, where we have 7,700 uh, 7, line items that have tariff-free access to the Chinese market, including sugar. The only country in the world that can export sugar to China is Mauritius. We have a comprehensive economic cooperation and partnership agreement with India, where 615 line items have tariff-free entry to the Indian market. We are part of the AFCFTA, which is the African, to African Continental Free Trade Area, where Mauritius is part of that, and we have ratified the same. COMESA and SADC already working very well, and they are our biggest import and export partners. We have an interim uh, 
economic partnership agreement with the EU, we have the same with the UK, and we are part of the Africa uh, Growth Opportunity Act of the USA, where we have over thousands of line items where they have preferential access to the US market. So Mauritius being a small country, island state, 2,044 square kilometers of land, but 2.3 million square kilometers of water, ocean, we're actually an ocean state, we're the second largest ocean state in the world, but despite a size, population size of 1.3 million people, we have access, preferential market access to 70% of the world population. And that explains why Mauritius is attractive to operators, whether they are from India, from China, using the Mauritius Freeport, which has been abjugated by the global FDI intelligence magazine as being the 10 best in the world and first in Africa, the Mauritius Freeport. So we have several operators like the French, uh, multi, uh, the French uh, supply chain company Decathlon for, for sportswear. The, the whole Africa Middle East operation has been shifted to Mauritius. We have one company that is moving for the manufacturing of EV uh, batteries is going to shift in Mauritius soon. So we can see a lot of these multinationals looking at Mauritius because of these ability. We talk about the legal system. We talk about the credibility of ease of doing business. We talk about the governance, the stability that the country gives. And you've seen earlier the accolades that we've been showing, whatever it's about democracy and everything. So we see a lot of companies looking at Mauritius. Now, also, the minister earlier talked about new structures for fund domiciliation, like the variable capital company, for example. And we've seen a lot of foundation from the US and across the globe looking at having fun of funds domiciling in Mauritius with the variable capital company, because you can have several structures, each their own legal identity, with a, uh, with a structure in the, in the, in the uh, Mauritius IFC. Right. This is another slide uh, that shows the, the, you know, the health check, let we call it, but how stable and liquid the Mauritius banking system is. Uh, the banking asset to GDP ratio is 438%. We heard earlier uh, the cost of capital is dependent on the amount of money that is standing in, your, in the banks. But in Mauritius, we can see there is substantial liquidity. The ripple rate, despite after COVID and with the war between Russia and Ukraine, cost of commodity going up, the ripple rate from the central bank is still 4.25% in Mauritius. So we managed to keep the cost of, of, of capital at a reasonable level to maintain substantial investment on the island. Three years in a row, Mauritius FDI is going to hit on average half a billion dollars. For a population of half 1.3 million people, uh, to get half a billion dollars of F investment on an uh, annual basis three years in a row, that's quite substantial. It shows that people believe in it. And don't forget, 75% of the GDP of Mauritius is service sector. So we don't have heavy industries uh, for companies to invest massively in assets like mining and so on. So that m the money that is coming in Mauritius is to further develop the service sector, which is financial services, ICT uh, services, and high-tech manufacturing. Yes, it's part of it as well. Uh, return on equity for the bank, averaging 10%, and the top banks are doing over 20%. Now, at a time where cost of capital is high, of course, return on equity is going to be high, but it shows how healthy banking uh, services is in Mauritius, and why using Mauritius for the continent makes a lot of sense. Then our number one bank in Mauritius, 62% of the profit uh, comes from uh, the continent. So it shows uh, using Mauritius as a platform for the continent makes sense. And we can see a lot of uh, alliances uh, between Mauritian financial institutions and global institutions happening, already happening in the legal uh, service sector as well, where a lot of Mauritian uh, solicitors are represent representing uh, uh, international legal firms in Mauritius to structure uh, investment across the continent. So I think, in essence, 
that ecosystem that Mauritius is creating uh, with the legal service, with the arbitration, with the Mauritius IFC itself that is coming with new structures and licenses on the day. As we speak, the minister is working on an ESG framework. We're working on ratifying the Cape Town Convention for the financing of movable assets on the continent that will make it more cost effective to finance railway stock on the continent, uh, to finance aviation stock on the continent. And as you know, connectivity is very poor on the continent, so we can expect that is going to be quite substantial over the next couple of years. So this is why we're here as well, to meet with people here in the UK and across the globe that can deliver these services because we want them to come to Mauritius and work with us to deliver these financial and financing services going, going forward. So that's our invite uh, to everybody. Talk to us. We have a lot of people here from Mauritius, uh, wonderful companies from Mauritius, I can see a lot of them here, friends of Mauritius sitting there as well, raising capital for the continent. But I think Mauritius is that gateway or that entry onto the continent that can help you mitigate your risk and drive trust when you're trying to have blended financing for projects. Gone are the days where one institution will finance a project $100 million and above. Now it's like a consortium of investment blocks getting together to raise capital. Convincing one person to put money in one location is easy, but convincing 2025 decision makers to go into a, any place that has a negative risk perception, that's not possible. And that's the ecosystem that Mauritius wants to create. That's the stability that our Bank of Mauritius gives us, managing a rate, a repo rate of 4.25% in these volatile times shows the ability of Mauritius to maintain the stability that investors are looking for. So that's why I'm inviting you all to know more about Mauritius. Come and visit Mauritius as well. It's a wonderful place, a beautiful place to visit as well. And we're looking forward to welcome you all in Mauritius. And don't forget, tomorrow morning we have a session on Mauritius, so please do join, do join us again. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Vinay. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people here from Mauritius um, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so 